presentation. Afterward, people will pause. But let's go back right in. Uh, how we're going to flank them. So in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, I've been really passionate about shared ownership of an airplane. And my goal with flying clubs is how do we operate an aircraft safely and spread the cost across as many people as possible so that we can afford to fly. Because let's face it, flying is not cheap anymore. So uh, dividing it up is one of the great ways to do it. Uh, whether it's a partnership or a flying club, they're kind of very similar, have similar concerns with how you operate it. It's just how you set it up at the beginning that's a real big difference. Uh, a little bit about myself, I started flying in 1997, uh, single engine multi-engine rated. Uh, I kept that magical 1500 hours that I don't plan to do anything with. I just, for whatever reason, I worked my way up to airline qualified and decided I just don't want to do it. Maybe one day, but not now. Uh, my wife and I are building an RV 14A. And if you haven't seen us on YouTube uh, talking about our 14 build, you can always look, look us up on YouTube. We're up there uh, building that plane uh, as much as we can. And uh, hopefully we're a little over a year into the build and uh, one more year we'll be flying the 14. And that 14 will not go into a flying club. That is our... Uh, but for the most part, I've been flying Bonanza's Cessna 414s, Cardinal RGs, and Beach Sundowner and more. The Beach Sundowner, we have a 10 person flying club right now. And a lot of the examples that we'll be talking about in this forum will be from that Beach Flying Club. Uh, before that, I uh, was the president of a, the Chandel Flying Club, which had three airplanes, 20 members, who uh, was president during a really difficult time when our Cardinal RG did a care of landing on uh, what was then one seven left at Austin Bergstrom. Were you working that day, Jeff? No? Uh, yeah, it's always fun to go out on the runway and take a picture of our airplane geared up with a crane up to it. Uh, the legalese, I am not a CFI, I am not a CPA, I am not an accountant or a lawyer. So your really hard financial questions, uh, I do recommend you find a professional. Uh, I am who I am, I'm just gonna pass on as much advice as I've learned over the last 10, 15 years, but do cross-reference with your professionals to make sure you're doing everything legal because we don't want anybody in trouble. So what is a flying club? Now, as I got more passionate about flying club, I learned there's a lot of different definitions of flying club. Um, go to the AOPA or EAA um, seminars, they're really passionate about telling you you can't have flight instructors, you can't be a flight school that looks like a flying club. There's so many different combinations out there, I really don't have a strong preference on that. For me, it is a group of people trying to share an airplane at the lowest possible cost. Should you accidentally over collect one year, 
you need to figure out a way to distribute that for the flying club benefit, not putting that extra money into one person's pocket. Uh, if you put the money into one person's pocket, you're no longer a flying club, you're a something else, <laughs> some play group or charter or something like that. But I use that as my definition. I'm less harping on the FAA definition or the AOPA's definition of, oh, you have a flight instructor attached to it, and that's the difference. Plenty of clubs have flight instructors who are members and still a truck with it, and that doesn't, that's not the definition. It's follow the money. It's where does that extra money go? The answer is there's never any extra money so you don't need to, to buy that. Uh, but there are many types of flying clubs. The small ones, like ours, is one airplane with uh, 10 members sharing it. Uh, I've partnerships, you get one airplane with three or four people sharing. That's really a flying club. Uh, in that case, all members have equity. Flying clubs, uh, half of our members have equity in the airplane. So what's the difference between a partnership and a flying club? The label that you use when you talk about it. There's really, you still need to collect money, you still need to operate that airplane safely, you still need to maintain it. Nothing really changes between a partnership and a flying club. It's just about the money that got it started is really the big difference between them. So if you're in a partnership, almost everything we talked about here will really apply. Uh, if you're uh, in a flying club, obviously this is what it's for. Um, how many of the people who are flying clubs are in a equity-based flying club where you actually have equity? And then how many are non-equity flying clubs? So it's about a 50-50 thing. Does it matter? Is anybody in a hybrid club where there's some equity and some non-equity members? It's a little experiment I started when we started our flying club, being a hybrid and doing a little bit of both. I got the view. I like it. Thanks. What's the number one most important thing in your flight club? Safety. Safety? Communication. Communication. You're all wrong. <laughs> all, all wrong. Is it the airplane? Safety? All that? Nah. It's really top second. Is it the members, the people you bring into the club? Important. But it's not the most important thing. The volunteers? Okay, your club's dead without volunteers. Clubs run on volunteers, but it's still not the most important thing. Your Excel spreadsheet. Your club, if you boil everything down to what a flying club is, you are agreeing on an Excel spreadsheet form. You're not joining a flying club to, you're not joining a flying club to pay $100 an hour to fly a plane wet. You're not joining a flying club to pay $93 a month. Those numbers are accurate for that point in time if you run your flying club correctly. What you are. Excel spreadsheet. 
most wine club problems are fixed at that level. So we're going to talk about how to define your uh, your spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet reflects the real cost to fly the airplane. You know it decides how you distribute those costs and when costs change. Like at our home airport, our hangar rate goes up every year. Our insurance seems to go up every year. Sometimes a little jump, sometimes a big jump. Fuel prices, they're always changing. So you can't promise your members that it's this much to fly when everything that makes up the cost of flying is rapidly changing. So you're promising them that the actual costs involved, hangar rent, insurance, fuel, maintenance, we're gonna plug it into this formula and it's gonna tell us how much it costs to fly. So when dues go up $5 next year, no one argues. Well, they can try, but there's nothing you can do because the costs change. And we are talking about how we're going to equally distribute these costs. Um, have a plan for overages. So go to both ways. Have a plan for when you have unexpected expenses and we all have to chip in. Have a plan for if you accidentally overcharge and you have a really good gear and you have a surplus, have a pre-negotiated plan with your flying club on how you're gonna spend that money. You know, you could do a party for the club, a social gathering, uh, upgrade to the airplane, so do that equity improvements, so you can do donations to uh, you know some flight charities. Have that plan baked in. Um, as I said, in our club, we've never had an executor plan because we're always buying the curve. Um, but that's deliberate in our club. We deliberately set our costs to be a little bit behind so that we can charge our under collection when needed because our club members would rather keep the money in their account than the club's account. We have a healthy interest reserve. We have a healthy reserve, but sometimes the big maintenance expense comes up and we just let it pay for it. We've negotiated that before we started. And we negotiate and educate new members as they come on that that is our strategy. So choose how to split the cost. Um, every club's gonna be different. And I'm gonna talk a lot about how I've done it. And I've learned a lot over the years, so I'm right. And there are all the other rates are wrong probably. But there are other good ways to do it. Um, you can do hourly rate only. How many people are flying the dry rate so fuel is not included? So a partnership that's dry and a club that's wet. Uh, you tend to see clubs do a little, uh, lean towards the wet rate. Now most everyone else is flying wet, wet rate fuel included. Um, so partnerships you typically see in uh, dry rate. Uh, I personally am on a mission to start changing the mentality on that, make everything wet. I think wet has a lot of advantages. And when we talk about fuel reimbursements, we uh, <laughs> cover some of those advantages. Uh, but if you're only charging an hourly rate, how are you collecting money if the plane is down for six months? How are you paying your anchor rent? How are you paying that? So if there's no monthly dues involved and you're just charging per hour, you're gambling on the fact that that plane is going to continue flying a constant amount. Now, if you're up north, you know the wintertime, you don't fly as much as summertime. Texas, it's the opposite. We don't fly in the summer. It's just, if I think there is a temperature the plane will spontaneously combust at, Texas is there, though. <laughs> um, so, more common is monthly dues and hourly rate, whether it's wet and um, whether it's wet or a dry rate. But at least you're constantly uh, collecting your fixed costs. Hanger rent, insurance, uh, some of your maintenance costs will be collected whether or not the plane flies. And then the more the plane flies, the more engine reserve, fuel, and uh, maintenance costs you're collecting. Uh, the simplest way to run a flying club, but this is not the right way, but if you wanted it simple, Tell them about your club, it's zero dollars to join, zero dollars a month to be in the club, and it's zero dollars an hour to fly this airplane. Sounds like a great deal, right? Every time the club has to write a check for fuel, maintenance, hangar, or something, 
just divided equally by the members. At the end of the year, the members will pay the exact dollar amount that it took to safely operate that airplane. It's the simplest way to run a flying club. And the lesson here is no matter what method you use to charge, you're basically doing that. You're just negotiating on how you distribute the net. If you start introducing an hourly rate, the reason you're introducing the hourly rate is to say, hey, Bob, you fly more than Joe does. Bob needs to pay more of the maintenance than Joe does. And that's what the hourly rate's doing is giving you an offset to allow people who fly more to pay more and people who fly less to pay less. So, you know, our, our answer is monthly dues and hourly rate. Now you just got to figure out what to charge for those two things. Um, but in all cases, your goal should be to collect the right amount of money at the end of the year to safely operate that airplane. No more, no less. It's simple, right? Now you, you know your hangar, right? You know your insurance bill. Simple. Uh, maintenance is your wild card. If you know exactly how much you're going to spend next year in maintenance, you're better than I am. I need you to pick uh, what is it, six random numbers for me, and I'm going to go buy a lot of your because uh, predicted maintenance is impossible. So, uh, your fixed costs things, you know, hangar rent, insurance, base annual inspection rate. Do you have a loan on your airplane? How many of you in the flying club are flying a financed airplane? And everyone else owns the plane outright. I'm a huge fan of finance and airplanes to start a plane club. It really reduces the buy in cost to get the club started. Uh, our loan is like $350 a month. And when it comes to splitting across 10 people, you really don't notice it. Notice it in the monthly dues. So, the effective way to start a club and um, just, just finance a plane. Um, don't forget those pesky little fees. You know, have a CPA that does your taxes. Uh, I'm not good enough to do our taxes, so we have a CPA. He does it, gives me a discount, which I think is for a flight once a year. But that's cheap insurance to make. Uh, you know, bookkeeper, um, software licenses, if you use something like the file partner software. Um, you know, just figure out, use things that help you, but make sure you, you're, you're paying for it in your monthly dues, because if the plane flies or not, and everyone's like, oh, our, our, our plane will always fly, it flies 200 hours a year. What are you gonna do when you have a new the wrong? And it's down for six months that you didn't plan. How are you gonna keep the club funded and functional while it goes to its fellow's times? That's why paying for your fixed costs with monthly dues is really important. Rate per hour. So again, if you're flying wet or dry, this is a big decision point. And I'll tell you, I don't think it matters. I tell people think about the dry rate and just add the fuel or not, because with a good fuel reimbursement policy, it's it doesn't matter. Anymore. It covers all the different scenarios of, of flying the airplane. But your hourly should cover unexpected maintenance. So we all know that we do more maintenance every year than just the engine. So we do oil changes. We do um, got to replace the brake pads. We got to um, fix this random squat. Take a look at your history. Hopefully you've been flying for a while and you know your history and see what your averages are for unexpected maintenance. Now the trick to that is when it comes time to do your maintenance. The majority of what you pay for your annual is unexpected maintenance, not the annual fee. Your annual, our spot AMP, charges a, a fixed rate to do the annual. That covers opening the airplane up, inspecting it, closing it up, assume, assuming the plane is airworthy and it finds no squawks. So that's our base annual, and we actually collect that out of our monthly dues because we're paying that whether the plane flew or not. Now, I've never had, actually, I think that that, we did have that annual. Uh, he replaced six screws in our last annual, and that was the only squad. We got lucky. Uh, we did have a uh, fresh engine overall since the previous annual. Um, but typically, the annual's a lot more than that, and 
that comes out of our maintenance fund versus completely funded by hourly flood time. And that is the one budget that is the most difficult for us to predict, manage, and keep on top of. Uh, oil burn, you should know that. Um, and you know, you should be planning, you're doing certain other oil changes, you just bake that into your hourly rate. Because you're not changing the oil on your airplane if it's not flying. So your every hour of life should add a little bit of money to oil. And once you think about the things that you pay for it more, it becomes more expensive the more the plane flies, your hourly rate should be following that. And the things that you're going to pay for if the plane sat on the ground for a whole year, your monthly dues should take care of that. So I've been going for a little while. Any questions so far that we have? Yes. Okay. So the question is, uh, time limited items like your uh, airplane battery. It fit for the Texas in the last three years for us. Other places in the last four or five years. What category do we find that kind of thing is from? Um, it's uh, Unexpected maintenance is what I call that. Uh, I I like simplicity. So yes, you could start planning monthly dues and save it and put in money for a battery away, but that requires. Remember, volunteers are your books. That requires them to have a lot more tracking in place to do that. So just make sure you 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 continue to fund your maintenance. So maybe you have five dollars an hour more because you're going to do it this way. So, uh, because the list of things that hit that category <coughs> is really long. Batteries, brakes, uh, brake rotors, um, uh, hoses, and it goes on and on and on. You know, battery is easy to do three years. What about the things that are 10 years, 15 years? Where are you gonna draw the line? So I say keep it simple and pay for it out of unexpected payments. Simplicity wins in the flight world. Because again, it's the volunteers that run it, your volunteers don't have time to handle top price. The only exception I have to that is water change if you know the calendar time in the for example in serious time, which is virtually every three years. Yes. Cost that's one thing. Yeah. It's gonna have to be done regardless of what the cost is. So big ticket items that are hard and time limited, like a serious parachute. So I don't know this big. Yeah. That so I use the fortune teller mentality here. If it's easy to tell the future, in that case, it's written in black and white. Yeah, plan for it and, um, and, and, adjust, and that's where it comes down to the spreadsheet, right? Because I'm sure your spreadsheet has that parachute accounted for. And uh, <clears throat> luckily, it's unlikely you're gonna have to go, oops, uh, we have to do it two years early, unless someone pulls a handle. Yeah, insurance covers it in that case. So, uh, use, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking simpler airplanes on a lot of my examples. Like I said, I put this around Beach Sun Downer, which doesn't have any of those hard limits, but that is a good point. Fuel policy. So, dry rate, we talked about. Wet rate. Um, so, let's, those who fly a wet, wet rate, who wants to be my guinea pig for uh, an example? Okay. So when you fly off field, and uh, I'll say, where were you from? Uh, well, Colorado. Colorado. So did you fly to Oshkosh? Yeah. In the club plane? Yeah. All right. Perfect example. When you fill up here, how are you going to reimburse it? Actual cost. Actual cost. So how much is fuel at the home airport? Uh, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> is it expensive or is it relatively competitive in your area? 625. $625. Okay. My home airport, I think it's up to like 750. So when we do a wet rate, we base it on our home airport rate. So our hourly cost is actually extreme. Now I think we're $123 an hour to fly a um, beach sundown on the way. No one buys fuel at our home airport. It's too expensive. They hate us. And even if you got them to come out and fill out our airplane, you know, it's just so we don't buy there. But every hour you fly, 
you are paying for $10 an hour at $7.50 an hour. Now, one of our cheap airports, Georgetown, is four, $4.20 an hour. It's been a while since I've flown, um, so I don't know the current numbers, but four twenty dollars an hour. Big console. Our club will pay for the fuel on their own credit card and submit their receipt. Now, a pilot partner, you just pull out the phone, take a picture, and submit it as part of your flight log, and it's all built into the app. So the treasurer doesn't have to do anything with this. So you get reimbursed. So if I buy 10 gallons of gas at Georgetown for $4.20, or the one that's, um, you know, $42 a gas. Forty-two, $42 a spent, but I'm going to get $72 credit on that flight because we reimburse at the whole airport. When you first say that, it's like, well, that sounds like you can game the system. But the pilot paid in their $123 an hour. They overpaid for that fuel already. It balances themselves out. Occasionally, a pilot will fly one hour, part of 10 gallons, and put 25 gallons of fuel into the airplane. It's because the previous guy couldn't be bothered to fill the plane back up to our green level. And it, it just works itself out. And we, we don't sweat those small details, but it allows us to, to put the decision in the pilot commands in mind, where do you want your fuel, how much of a discount do you want? In our car, we can save $20 an hour uh, flight time by buying fuel off airport. Yes, I have to add 0.3 or 0.4 in my flight to make an unexpected stop. So a lot of our pilots just plan for that. Sometimes the pilot will pull the plane out, have the FBO fill it up as they're going out across country, and then they will add fuel and get it reimbursed. Uh, if you go to an expensive airport, who's charging $10 a gallon gas, no problem, buy as much as you want. You're getting paid back $7 regardless. It's your decision on pilot command to flight plan to find the airports that suits your needs and safety. Did you have a question? No. Um, yes? You keep track of your own rate and how often do they check it on the data? Luckily, Signature is really lazy if they don't carry their own rights. Um, but it's our treasurer's job because uh, our FBO will, so if you buy fuel at home, uh, our pilots just call signature, they put fuel in and charge the club's uh, credit card. So the, uh, we get an email with the rate on it, and if we start seeing rates change, um, we'll, we'll huddle with the, really me, the treasurer, and we'll say, okay, it's time to change the rate. Mm -hmm. Happens once a year at most for us. Um, but it's also, since so few people buy fuel, there's been times that the rate did change. It was a, just let it run because as long as people aren't buying a lot of fuel at home, it doesn't matter what number I have plugged in there, they're getting the reimbursement regardless. So uh, we don't change it that often. Um, yes? We check monthly. Yeah. So you can. So what was the rate today? That's what we'll charge for the next month. So it balances out that way. Once you realize that as important as Excel spreadsheet is, don't you realize that it's always wrong, but consistent is better than not? It's, it, it makes up for being wrong. So don't sweat the small things. Uh, if you know it changes regularly, check it monthly, uh, makes sense. But you do have to understand that there's a period of time that you might have been collecting a gold number that you're going to overcorrect for it for the next month, and then it's going to change, so you're always one month behind. If you average it out over a couple of years, it balances out. It, 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 just don't sweat the small things. So, card in the airplane. This is one of my um, one of the things I'm trying to learn. I hate the card in the airplane. I trust my club members to fly my airplane, but I don't trust them. In my Number one. Number two, how many times have you gone to an airport and landed, you get your service fees, your fuel, and everything wrapped into one? You don't, and it becomes an accounting nightmare to separate that out. 
Whereas if you switch that to you pay for it personally, um, then you, in Pilot Partner, you're just typing in the number of gallons, the math works out so that the member pays for those service fees, which is what you want. The club shouldn't be paying for those. The other thing I love about it is my members get to distribute their cost of buy across two different cycles. Put half of it on their credit card, and they can pay that as they want and get their credit card points and their bonuses and miles, and then pay their monthly bill for flying separately. Uh, you tend to see members will fly more than they can do because members don't use their credit card to pay for the flying with us because of the transaction fee is higher. If you do bank transfer, it's much cheaper, so it allows them to, like me personally, like to get my credit card points. So it allows me to get half of my flying and credit card. So, and if you have to card the plane, well, I lost the card, what do you do? You know, next, you got a county nightmare. Um, I really like to let the members pay for that, for that reason. And if you're doing that, you're effectively doing reimbursing actual costs. Yes. Yeah, so then you got the problem of, um, you go to an expensive airport, you use the club credit card. Now you're paying $10 a gallon for fuel when it's $3 at home. Your wet rate didn't, Factor in the 10 gallon an hour for fuel, you're allowing the, cl the club members say, Oh, of course, I'm going to go to the class Broadway airport. It's closer to home. It doesn't cost me anymore. Uh, so, when you put it in the hands of the pilot command to make the decision, a lot of good things happen. And when we get into the concept of flying like an owner, that is a critical part of it for the mentality of a, fly, of a successful flying club is, whether it's equity or not, everybody acts like an owner from the time they book the airplane until they safely put it in the hangar. They are the only owner of the airplane between that time and then. That's what makes uh, a flying club sustainable. Uh, when people treat it like a rental, your maintenance costs uh, uh, soar really high. So what's your club's tolerance to risk? This is something that we discussed very heavily when we created our first Excel spreadsheet. I asked the club members, do you want me to charge a higher monthly dues and a higher co cost per hour to fly, but I would be very unlikely to come to you and say, I need a check for more in case something unexpected happens. Or would you rather us chip in more often when things happen? We decided to set it at about 75%. Do a 75% good job, look it into the future, and say these are the reasonable things we're going to spend our money on. But when uh, um, there are some of the things that happened recently, uh, alternator. Or all, we went to a saga with like three dad alternators in a row keep replacing it, we exceeded our maintenance budget a little bit. So in that case, it's like, this was not reasonable. Uh, we're about $300 over. We've got four class A members, uh, equity members. Uh, we all need to ship in 75 extra boxes. So we, we like to not overcharge on our dues. So we take that into account for those fees that we can't predict well, our maintenance costs. So the way we look, I think we do $5,400 a year maintenance is what our budget is currently set on. If our risk tolerance was lower, so we didn't want to chip in as often as we do, I would just up that to 7,000 and let the spreadsheet tell us what to charge. In that case, I would be more likely to have to have conversations of, well, we've got a surplus, what do we want to do with it? Our club, we've decked our plan out pretty nice. We have a G5 in there already. We got the GPS in there. Uh, we don't have an autopilot. So we don't really have much that we want to spend the money on. So we'd rather keep it in our pockets. So we deliberately set a lower maintenance cost to represent that. Jim? We Okay. 
So it, he's in the military community who's expecting soldiers to rotate through the club more frequently. So the question is, what is your risk tolerance? I would aim, if we were at 75%, I would for you aim closer to 90% because you don't want that burden to carry over. If you're expecting a high turnover in your club and you don't want um, a new member to join who have to pay for the deficit that was created by the, the previous group of people. So for you, I would just up it a little bit and be a little bit more cautious. Um, so some examples, these were real numbers as of uh, pretty recently. Uh, hangar, 618 a month. Insurance was $4,600 a year. Uh, if we have time, we'll do a deep dive into insurance for flying clubs. Uh, fixed aircraft cost is $1,700 a year. There's GPS updates, that's um, our base annual fee, that's some other things that we, we're gonna pay for if that plane flies or not. Uh, our loan is now $475 a month after we overhaul the engine and some other things in there. Uh, that's how we figured out um, our hourly rate between the cost for fuel, uh, the maintenance cost, and factoring our TDO. Uh, we figured $27,000 for the engine. Because when it comes time to TDO, I wheel and deal. Yes? That's probably going to be more expensive than what we'll fix on our new system. Uh, we just were less than 18 months since our last one. Okay. I came in under that budget. I, uh, like I said, I wheel the deal. Um, we have a really good local engine guy who did the actual rebuild for us. Um, saved us a lot of money and his reputation, we did a much better job. But don't, if you have an O360, do not write down $27,000 because it's going to cost you more unless you've got some of the agreements that I have in place for our club. Yes? Where are you getting your insurance? Uh, I forgot, our liability limits are, so we did something interesting with our insurance. My broker convinced me to look at getting flight instructor, flight instruction insurance instead of flying flight insurance. And I pushed back on that first. And then he gave me a quote on both. It was within a hundred dollars of each other. He gave me a lot more flexibility. So our policy, like a flying club policy, you typically have to submit a roster once a year. You have to submit your um, bylaws to say who is what. And they will often put in clauses, which I resist a lot, to tell you how to tell your members to fly. With flight instructor insurance, um, we name a uh, chief CFI, who by the way has never seen an airplane. Uh, he did teach me how to fly sun down once he got an instrument rating 10 years ago. They just wanted his name. They never had to do anything. And um, the requirements are anybody who I say is okay is insured in that airplane. It created so much flexibility for us. Um, I will never go back unless the rules change and we get a much different deal. <laughs> Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think we have uh, a million dollar um, liability on it. Um, I probably should have done it. It's been about two years since I wrote the policy. Um, it's high enough that I tell all, all of our club members to read the insurance and understand it. And you can go out, you, there's no reason to go out and buy additional all insurance in our club. But um, if you want more liability, you can get a non-owner's policy and do that. No one in our club does. But as far as the liability limits, you just tell your broker what you need and they'll quote. If you want more, it just costs you a little bit more. So uh, it's definitely, you know. You pay you 10 times. Pay 10 times? Well, we got one airplane. Um, yeah, there's a lot of factors, um, but the, how many members do you have? 70. 70? So that's the, yeah, we got 10, we got 10 members. So at least you get to distribute that 10 times cost across 70 members. So 
that doesn't work out to be that that much more than we're paying per minute. Um, that's another thing people all, this is one thing I do agree with AOPA and EAA on, is the more members you have, the more insurance is gonna be, but the more you're splitting it up, it's not that, um, it's not that impactful. Uh, and at the end of the day, insurance is insurance, you're gonna pay for it, you're gonna have it, you're, you're, you need to have it, and you're gonna divide it by the number of members. So how much those, that insurance costs, is a factor that you determine how many members you want per airplane. We find 10 per airplane is the right number, but insurance is a lot more. I can find that the sweet spot is 12 per airplane. So that's what we find out when we start using the Excel spreadsheet is, yes, it's the, it's the formula that you're agreeing on, but before you agree on the formula, you're debating some of the impacts, number of members and number of airplanes, and you're seeing what generates the number that's attractive for the group. So you can, you can tweak all those numbers to get what you want. Um, this is an actual screenshot from our actual flying club of our uh, operational cost that is a, determines our monthly dues and how we break that up. You know, our hangar rent, insurance, aircraft fees, QuickBooks, how much we pay for final partner, uh, aircraft loan, um, our office costs, our CPA cost is all in there. Um, yeah, I think this is a year old because we're really doing an update this presentation from last year. Uh, but so the numbers have gone up a little bit since last year. But all we do is as they change, we come to our spreadsheet, type it in, go to our club and say your new rates are. based upon the condition of the engine and what our AMP is telling us. And if we're at 2,200 hours, and our uh, mechanic is seeing no signs of uh, needed to overhaul soon, we're gonna start lowering our rates. We're gonna start collecting less for our engine overhaul because we have a fully funded engine fund. I don't need to collect that money from our members. So we'll go through a period of time to find cheaper. Uh, still collect some to you know, make it a little bit more. Uh, so that when that engine needs to be overhauled, we've got it funded and paid. So look at the start of Flying Club. My biggest piece of advice, now do you think I love Excel spreadsheets? Because this is the second time I'm gonna tell you that I have an Excel spreadsheet. I hate Excel. I'm a software engineer by trade. My job is to eliminate Excel spreadsheets. But when you're acquiring an airplane, have a similar concept of an Excel spreadsheet that you can just plug the numbers into and your members are agreeing to the formula because everyone's going to say, hey, I have a buddy who's selling this airplane. It's great, great, we'll just plug the numbers in and we'll see if it's a good deal or not once we plug the numbers in. You know, how much is it going to cost to pre-buy it? You know, how much is it going to cost, you know, the asking price, what the current time of the engine is are all important factors. But the things that people forget is Put 10% on top of the purchase price for post-purchase maintenance tax. If um, we got away with no tax and taxes, uh, but figure out all the feet, and if it's far away, put a line item in there to transport the plane to the whole base once it's purchased. But that 10% surplus for post-purchase maintenance. The most expensive maintenance year will be the first year you own that airplane. No matter how great of a job the previous owner took care of that airplane, you get new people flying, new environments, things always come up. So fund it. And in case you don't use it, your next annual is cheap. It's already paid for. You can always start reducing your rates for the next year to give some of that money back. But take the emotions out of the purchase. We almost bought a Arrow for our club, and oh, talk about failing a pre-bought inspection. And this is a 
UPS captain who owned it, and he's like, this is the best maintained airplane we've ever seen. Our mechanic spent a day to tell us how much work this plane needed. The instrument panel was, wasn't even attached correctly, and it was at risk of falling on top of the yoke and jamming the yoke up. The gear was rigged wrong. Um, things that were solvable, but the, the cost to get it to our standard was just too high to make sense. So, and I had people who were running out in our clubs, running out to local flight school to get their top flights endorsement. They were about to get an arrow. And they violated the take the emotions out of the purchase clause of this. And we sent that plane home. Uh, so what's expected out of your members? This is the most important part after your Excel spreadsheet. When new members come to our club, we make them go through a new member interview. Now, we're not really interviewing them. Are, are you going to be a good uh, pilot for us? Are you, are you, you know, all this? We want to make sure they understand our expectations. And at the end of it, if they still want to give us money, and we still want to take their money, we welcome them to the club. As a result, we have a group of people we really enjoy flying with. We have 10, I think, of the best pilots in the Central Texas area flying our airplane. You, as a member, are the sole owner of that airplane from the time you book it till the time you return it at home. So people always ask, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, what if I get a flat tire down there? What if, uh, uh, what if I can't get the plane home? You know, are you gonna cover my airline ticket to get home while the plane gets fixed? My answer is, if you were the only owner of the airplane, would they pay for your airline ticket to go home? Well, who's they? There is no they in our flying club. You are the owner of the airplane who would want you to act like that. Now, if you were off field and stranded and have a flat tire, step one, call the maintenance officer. We're going to give you your advice. We are going to support you. And our maintenance funds are available. It's spelled out in our bylaws on how much you can spend for a flight safety issue. You know, we will obviously help them fix that. Um, but you are the project manager of bringing that plane home. Now, if life says you do need to come home and you do book an airline ticket to come home, we'll work with you to get the plane back, but it's at your expense because you are the only owner of that airplane to fill it safely back in the hangar. Uh, we want people to come up and do oil changes. We want, I want every member of our club, it doesn't work this way, I try it. Want well, every member of our club to have a job as a volunteer. Even as simple as once a year, sweep the hangar out. Uh, as it turns out, two of us do all the work and eight of us help where they can. Uh, I'm the president and I do the president stuff. And then my treasurer is the key person who makes this club work. If does anybody in here have a flight club who does not like their treasurer? Okay. Anybody raise their hand, I was just going to ask you to leave. <laughs> because your treasurer is the reason you have your flying club. Without that treasurer, you do not have a club. You, as a club, do everything you can for that treasurer. And I wrote Pilot Partner to be the treasurer's best friend. Doesn't make every pilot happy. He's like, oh, I get one more and a half, I get a lot more flight. And it's like, yeah, but you're doing it for the treasurer. It makes the treasurer's job a lot, a lot easier. But uh, how many here volunteer for their flight club? What do you do? What's your volunteer job? Uh, my volunteer job is I oversee the Pardon? Right behind the treasurer? Far more important than the president. I'll tell you that. I also don't work as a maintenance officer. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, what are some other examples of uh, volunteer jobs? So I forgot to mention this earlier, but uh, we are giving away a pair of uh, flying on sunglasses for the most interaction. Whoever gives me the best story, the best uh, thing to go with this, so you get a free pair of flying on sunglasses. And if uh, you haven't seen these glasses, uh, Dean is a good friend of ours who uh, I've known him since uh, he first started this company. Amazing sunglasses that fit under.
onto your headsets. Thin, unbreakable, and your headsets will seal around you. So there, 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 there's a payoff for being interactive. So culture of the flying club. Why, why am I harping so much on being an owner, act like an owner? Because it drives your maintenance costs down. You want to eliminate your flying club, treat it like a rental. Rental planes are hard, you get more maintenance, and you know, we, none of us when we're buying an aircraft want to buy a former flight school airplane. So don't put, don't make it into that in your flying club. Teach your people to love the plane to treat it like it was their own. When you buy an airplane, say it's a 12 airplane. Yep. Who actually has got a title of the airplane? So who actually has the title of the airplane when you buy an airplane? In our case, uh, we formed an LLC for our club. Uh, you can also do a 501C7, uh, which is better, more paperwork. Uh, uh, we recommend that over an LLC, but we've made an LLC work. It, the plane is titled in our club's name. Because we financed it, bank wouldn't grant the loan to the club without me personally co signing on it. So uh, the loan is to the LLC, but I do I have to co sign uh, uh, as, as the president. And uh, we have a clause in our bylaws that should the club ever become unable to function, that the ownership of the plane will transfer to me, I will immediately sell it and distribute the costs, uh, the proceeds minus any um, cost to do it amongst the equity members. So we just wrote that out. So okay, where did, where did the money actually come from? Did it come from the four equity members? Yes. So they split it with some rational some sort of equal or they decide what how they want to come from that. So when we formed the club, four of us got together, agreed on an Excel spreadsheet to acquire the airplane, which dictated how much we would put in. And we evenly put in as the four members. And after the club got up and running, our monthly dues were way high uh, because there's just the four of us. Then we recruited first four non-equity members, and we went and got two more. And all that did was subsidize our monthly dues and pack our budgets. So we did the equity first, then added the non-equity on the side. And we charged for non-equity $500 non-refundable initiation fee. And uh, we charged a lower monthly due. So I'm paying almost $300 a month as an equity member. Our non-equity members are paying about $95 a month. And the next thing is, Also, they pay only for like hours of maintenance that they do and have to make sure that they're available to work on the airplane. So we have a relationship with a mechanic um, and who's not affiliated with the club. The club is a customer of the mechanic, and uh, we pay his invoices. Okay, so it's a trade. So yeah. yeah, I don't like you can get lucky and have a mechanic associated with the club who will you know, work with the club, but you're really asking a lot of special favors of a professional. So I recommend keeping your maintenance re uh, relationship very professional. You are a customer. You do work with us in accordance with the FAA, with your AAI license, and we pay you for it. It should be that simple. Um, clubs that blur that line, really blur the line of we're not all equal. Same thing, we have a flight instructor who is a member in our club. Great, you can fly our airplane left seat anytime you want. Uh, if one of our club members wants to hire you as a CFI, that's between you and the club member. But as a CFI, you are not an active club member. The person sitting in the left seat is the club member who is the owner of the airplane. But the more pride people take in the airplane, now we picked a Sun Dapper for a specific reason. It's not a 172. And it's kind of a unique airplane, and our club has pride over the fact that we fly a Sun Dapper. That's our airplane. Uh, it's been on YouTube a couple times on Flying Doodles and on the Pilot Partner channels and other places. Uh, we have a November 
14 Victor Echo Channel. I did a, I finally got to go do the, um, trying to see if I can get night current in one pass. There was a controller who kind of helped me out with that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> we talked about it for weeks and um, we went out on a, it was a what's 1 8, right? So, hey, 12,000 feet? 12,000 foot runway, and I tried to do three stop and goes in one pass. I only felt comfortable doing two. So, they looped me back around, and uh, I had a class tour of the airport to myself for like a 20 minute walk. It was fun. <laughs> so, uh, but we take a lot of pride in our airplane, and that's what you want to build in your club. The more pride your members have, the less they treat it like a flight school, the better your plane's gonna be, the cheaper it's gonna be to operate safely, and the happier your club's gonna be. Uh, so, shared ownership is the only way to go. Uh, added new club members. Like I said, that, that new member interview and onboarded new members is really important. I find a lot of clubs fail by saying, oh great, we got a new member, we got their money. Did anybody take it for a flight? Did you teach them how you want them to operate the airplane? The job doesn't end with them signing whatever documents you have. You want to make sure you bring them into a family, not a business. Does anybody run your flight club as a business? So, and there are clubs out there that are more business focused. We, we got it. business association of that is really simple. Here's 10 bucks now, I want a hamburger. With a flight club, it's the people who are consuming the product are also part of the input of how we run it and how that should happen. Now, some bigger club, you got 70 members in your club, you're gonna have to run it a lot differently than I run my club with 10 members. One of the reasons why I don't want to grow our club significantly. You were as high as 90 and 6. Yeah. We're down to 70. Yeah. 90 and 6 makes, makes the people who are volunteering to run it crazy. Yep. Exactly. You need you get scale your volunteers with, and you got to hope you have some people with financial and CPA experience or you're, you're in trouble. Uh, but make sure you onboard your pilot, your, your new members. Make sure that they understand your expectations and it's not a, hey, I gave you this document. It's like, make sure you pair them with someone in the club that goes live and actually um, experience it firsthand. Do you, do you require club checklists? A club instructor that needs a guy who was never a club on some level of his instructor. Do you require that before that guy can schedule an airline? So you require checkouts. Require checkouts. And then we require two check rides a year for every member. Okay. So requiring two check rides a year in the club. Yes. You had a question behind? Uh, yeah, well, can you reference what the thought process or reason was behind the uh, different member rates? It seems like non-equity members could perhaps be paying more per month than equity members because they didn't attend that yeah. What was the reason? So how we set up our hybrid equity versus non-equity? Um, Equity members pay more a month, less per hour to fly, and have greater access to the schedule. So we can book a month in advance for a full week at a time. Non-equity members pay a small initiation fee. Well, us equity members pay the equity to get the airplane. Non-equity members get a small, non-refundable initiation fee, uh, lower monthly dues, higher cost to fly, 
I was at work in our spreadsheet, whatever the cost of supply is, plus $20. As the president, I choose which budget that $20 surplus goes to based upon what is our shortcoming. And half access to the schedule. So they're 14 days in advance and only three days at a time. So they can take it for a long weekend, but not a whole week. So that's how we balance that out. Um, it's really working well for our club, but it's something you can tweak for if you're interested in doing the hybrid experiment. Figure out what your members, what sets it apart, because you don't want non-equity to be so awesome that no one will ever buy an equity position. So you gotta have that balance in there, and that has worked out really well for us. Because we're not getting equity in a blank book to get rich, that's not gonna happen. Have you taken on any new equity members since the initial purchase? We've had one equity position change hands, and it went from a non-equity member to an equity member. That member is now about to start his airline career, and he's contemplated selling, so uh, fingers crossed that will go smooth. So, uh, now the two check rights a year thing. Let me see if I have a slide. Oh, that's the very next slide. I love how this <laughs> tees it up. Rules in our flying club are simple. All pilots agree to follow the FARs. If the FAA calls me and says, hey, uh, your plane was flying, do blah, 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 and we want to talk to the pilot, I'm giving your name up. I'm checking the schedule, I'm saying, oh, that was uh, John Smith, and yeah, he was on the schedule, uh, here's his phone number. I'm done. I am not an intermediate to stand between the FAA and that. And this happened once, we had uh, an induction leak in our plane and our pilot, uh, uh, declared an emergency, and we got called by the FAA. Uh, I think you were working that way. Uh, and we talked with the FAA, and all he wanted was the dog of endorsement from the uh, AMP returning to the service. Uh, but, so you, you're going to agree to follow the FARs. You will read a body by the insurance policy. So as part of the new member package, you get a copy of our insurance, you understand the limits, you understand what you get, what you don't get, and what the insurance company will disqualify the client payment on. As a pilot command, you are gonna understand that. We have our schedule of rules, which I just mentioned, you know, the one month or the uh, two weeks that they apply to your member. And commercial lots are prohibited, so you cannot, you know, do a uh, charter or something out of an airplane or any other commercial thing. Flight instruction is okay as long as it's the club member who's being instructed. If you are a club member who has a CFI, you cannot run a bootleg CFI operation and train people on your airplane. Pilot command has received the instruction as a data. Everything else is just a policy. We tell people we want to fuel them at the slots or the depth of the airplane. Uh, we tell people that we want, you know, certain things. I do not want to do a twice a year check ride for our case. Now, once you have the 70 members, you may have some different concerns than we do. But I don't want anybody from the outside looking in to say, we are certified that this pilot is fine to fly the airplane. That is the FAA's job to do. With the flight reviews and, uh, the insurance requirements between the FAA and the insurance, they determine that our member is safe to fly, not us as a club. And that's why I don't want flight club insurance in our airplane, because the insurance companies tend to start dictating things like check rides and currency flights that are under the FAA. So for us, if you're good to fly, I don't care. If you haven't, I don't even ask to see your medical. It's between you and the FAA and the insurance company. You sign the paper that if the insurance company denies the claim, you owe us an airplane. I recognize it might be hard to get in some cases. You know, because not everyone just has an airplane stack shaped cash in their back pocket. But that's why we choose people to join the club. We have 35 people on the waiting list for our club. And I don't choose the top person. I if we go on the topic, we get down to about 15 to 45 first person ready to go when we have an opening. So we choose people who, I don't have to worry about that. Um, do, you, do you retain or have a certain uh, your operation? 
we don't have ongoing services with an attorney. We, uh, one of our members is an attorney, uh, so we kind of relieved on him a little bit when we needed to. We got some referrals in the beginning, but for the most part, once we got it running, we don't um, uh, routinely uh, engage with an attorney. It's a uh, construction insurance. So it's the type of insurance that a flight school gets to do flight instruction in. And uh, my broker recommended it to me. Uh, so I recommend just contacting a broker and talk to them and said, give me a quote for instruction insurance. So it's I'm club insurance. And weigh the pros and cons of the flexibility it gives you versus the cost, which in our case was like $10 more a year. It was an easy choice for us. Hopefully everyone else is, gets a similar experience. Yes, sir. So we use Pilot Partner. So it's a piece of software that I've written that is basically built from the ground up to manage the flying club and does all these policies. So yeah. it's, a, it's a popular one. Uh, Pilot Partner, uh, I do the flight circle guy when he first started it. Uh, he built it to support flight schools and kind of adapted it to kind of be flying clubs. I built Pilot Partner from the ground up, started in 1997, and it's flying clubs from day one because it's the electronic pilot logbook software coupled with the flying, uh, flying club management software all built into one. So we, uh, we do scheduling through Pilot Partners integration with Google Calendar. So just open up Google, pop it in, and it works. Yes, so uh, we do have a maintenance officer, and in case our club is me. Um, our AUP is like I said, we treat him like a professional. Uh, we hold him accountable. He's also a good friend of mine, so that makes it easy. Half the time, I'm not returning to Mitchell's for him. Yeah, when he's doing an annual, I'm down there helping him. Uh, which is also a sign off on some of our home bills that he's trying to convince me to get my AUP to help him out later. But, uh, so, in our case, uh, I'm very active with our AUP as maintenance is being done. And I work in tight partnership as my role as maintenance officer with the professional who is our AMP. to a zero-time pilot who wants to get their private pilot's license, we will indicate, hey, we've got some flight instructors that we know of who have flown their airplane, shop and hire them independently, uh, but flight training is completely between the pilot and uh, the CFI. Oh. No, why? Yeah, it's not a Again, once you start doing safety meetings, you're starting to step in and say, as a club, you know better than the FAA and insurance who and who is qualified to fly your airplane. So do we have discussions as a club about safety related things? Yes. We do a lot of, a lot of them electronically. Uh, we do show call day a lot where when we have a maintenance issue, my club is asking questions. We're very interactive. We get all the benefits of the safety meetings without making it a and without making it a requirement. I want our members to be proactive about getting their safety knowledge versus being forced to sit down in a room and hear something that they didn't ask for. So we tailor it to the events that are happening. Uh, when our uh, alternator was having problems, we had all kinds of discussions about what could go wrong or right with alternators. I know from your Zero. It's between, oh, they're going to take their airplane. They are an owner. Yeah. But once you get that mentality of everyone is 
they are the owner of the airplane from the time they book it till they bring it home, it eliminates a lot of this need to control them. I don't want to control our pilots. If they screw up and date the airplane or crash the airplane, that's what we have insurance for. I'm too busy to have monthly safety meetings or to double check their work that was between them and the FAA. I didn't write the FAR about currency and behavior. That's between the pilot and the FAA, not me. If I was the single owner of that airplane, is there someone checking my log to see if I'm current or not? No. And that's the culture I want to flag for is you are the owner of that airplane. Members who won't pay their dues on time. Yeah. Um, it's very rare. Uh, we're actually it's happening right now with one of our members, and uh, for us, it's simple. Uh, number one, that's the new member interview. We bring people into the club who will talk to us and understand the importance of it. Uh, number two, I guess we'll send up, you know, we go to pick your knees or something. I don't know. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we communication is our number one thing. We have one member who got three months behind just because they was, his medical got hold and he's fighting for it. He's got he follow up like, dude, uh, so you need to pay. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he, he pays for help. So we're fortunate that we haven't had a fight with that. Uh, I wouldn't let it go wrong if we lost communication. Uh, we do have bylaws that allow us to expel them from the club, and we would, and um, you know, we'll keep up with that for a long time. Easy, easy solution to the problem part of the buy-in is the deposit. And then if the member makes a misstanding, it's the deposit back. And they're over here, never allowed to be at this point. So, so he's saying that the easy solution is to collect the deposit, but if they leave a good statement, they get the deposit back. That is a solution. Now I've got to save that money and make sure I have it when they leave. We run our club to the wire on purpose. Uh, we choose not to do that because, again, I don't have a full time bookkeeper to keep track of that. We solve that problem too. So when the new member comes in, that's the reason. So it's easy. So we don't, we don't have to wait. So when the, when the new member comes in, their deposit pays for the next, for the person leaving to cover that. That can work. Except for we've had months where we've had a gap that took us time to fill to get somebody in. And, you know, I, I, I like it simple. I don't, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. Um, if you feel comfortable managing it. I don't, so we don't do that. Your There's also things called unknown unknowns. Yeah. There's stuff you need to put money away for where you don't really know how big the exposure is because you don't want to put your airplane down for an excessive amount of time. So do you factor that in somehow? Do you put a nice little amount into the airplane insurance you got a cushion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Y
the um, uh, my slide with fly eyes is so the fly eyes booth is just at the base of the tower. So if you haven't checked them out, please go see our friends at Fly Eyes. They're the best glasses and sunglasses out there. So who's interested in this fly eyes? All right, who's got the best horror fly club story? Uh, so we have a uh, in aircraft urinal. I forget what it's called. Oh. Yeah, Porta John. And there's a female attachment, but the female attachment got used to, as a funnel to put oil into the urinal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who can beat that story? Oh. oh. And the engine had just had its kind of overhaul. Uh, it was it was just almost due for its first hundred hours. Uh, <laughs> all right. Unexpected prop strike or urinal as a urinal. 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 Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you everyone. We do have t-shirts and cards up here, so feel free to come and uh, grab uh, Melissa and I can help you with that. Thank you for showing up and uh, this is one of my favorite parts of Oshkosh is uh, just getting up here and people listening to me for reasons I don't understand. <laughs>